gun. You can't fight in here. This is the war room. Shit filters full. Really? Yeah. I always go backwards when I'm backing up. What are you under? Yeah, he's got to do something for a living these days. Diane ain't much of a living boy. You failed to maintain your weapon, son. It's liberty! He, he's hurt! Whiskey, quick. Master, we are here. But what I do have are a very particular set of skills. <laughs> <laughs> Why is mad? Something is going to happen. What's going to happen? Something wonderful. You can call it the art of fighting without fighting. We started a game we never got to finish. I was just fooling about. I wasn't. Why don't you make like a tree and get the fuck out of here? Give me liberty or give me death! <laughs> Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Ernest Emerson Podcast, a podcast where both you and I get to talk with, listen to, and ask questions of some of the most interesting people in the world. We only have one disclaimer. If you are offended by the truth, please go away. Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, I'm here today with Danny T. Good morning, Danny. Good morning, Ernie. Uh, We have a really interesting guest on today. Uh, And he's one of those guys who most of us don't ever get a chance to learn about the things that that he is an expert in. And that's uh, medieval and Renaissance combat. His name is John Clements. And... uh, He's a very articulate guy. He's he's a scholar slash uh, man at arms, if you will, and is he's traveled all over the world extensively, searching and and finding original source material for medieval combat and the European uh, uh, all, all the way back to uh, you know Sparta and Greece and Rome and. You know, the Celtic and all the way through northern Germany and Vikings and uh, all the knights and the Crusades, all all of those things uh, are part of his field of study. And, and he's he's interested in the combat aspect uh, and, and weaponry and, and warfare. But along the way, because, and again, I'm nowhere near, anywhere near uh, his universe of, of knowledge, but... I have found that because I'm interested in that stuff also, that if you're learning about the the the, the method of warfare or or the method of combat, let's say for the for the Greeks or Alexander the Great or the or the Romans or even gladiatorial combat or or anything, that when you start delving into that, you also pick up all of the history around it all of the things that uh, that you're supposed to learn about in school and all that. So uh, this is a guy who's, who's uh, he's like a Encyclopedia Britannica of all this stuff. And it's, it's going to be very interesting today. So I, I felt uh, that it would be prudent for us to, I'm going to read something today that is from our organization called the Order of the Black Shamrock. And it is the uh, 12 Rules of the Order. And... Because we are based upon a chivalric uh, ideal of the warrior, uh, the poet warrior, the scholar warrior, uh, the knights, if you will, the the ideas of chivalry and and, uh, honor and integrity and all that, uh, which comes to us from our Western uh, heritage, if you will, uh, I felt it would be a good idea to read these uh, the rules of our order, uh, the Order of the Black Shamrock. So I'm just going to read those today, and that'll lead us right up to a discussion about uh, the history of all of that stuff uh, with John Clements. So here we go. One, practice your skill at arms diligently and with proper intent, seeking excellence in all endeavors. Number two, Always be prepared to do battle for the cause of freedom, liberty, 
justice, and all that is good. Number three, never be silent among the voices of falsehoods, no matter the number, for truth shall be your shield against harm. Number four, be willing to endure hardship, pain, or death to protect women, children, and the defenseless against harm. Number five, always act in a noble and chivalrous manner, worthy of respect and honor. Number six, always keep your weapons safe, clean, and at the ready, should they be needed. Number seven, never use force of arms or force of will for any unjust purpose. Number eight, Obey the laws of the land if they be not contrary to the higher laws of morals, ethics, and truth. Number nine, thou shalt be everywhere and always the champion of the right and good against injustice and evil, being always mindful to temper justice with mercy. Number ten, Thou shalt never lie, and shall remain faithful to thy pledged word. Number eleven, thou shalt never recoil before thine enemy. Number twelve, never abandon a friend, ally, fellow member of the order, or a noble cause, and remain loyal to one's friends, family, and those who lay their trust in thee. Now, those are the rules of the order when you swear an oath to become a member of the Order of the Black Shamrock. And honestly, if we, if we f- all followed those rules, uh, it would be a much better place to live, I think. Uh, today, we are, we're rife with uh, injustice. We're rife with uh, anger. Uh, we're, we're rife with people that don't keep their word people that lie, cheat, and steal. And uh, when we look at our children, they are, those are the examples that are being set uh, by a large part of society. And, you know, children are a reflection of the things they're taught, uh, the, the examples that are set for them. So, you know, as a member of this order, it, part of our charter is to pass on these ideas to uh, the next generations, uh, our children and their children, and to instill in in these young people, uh, both men and women, boys and girls, uh, these simple ideas that if you you live by, uh, life becomes a lot easier, and life basically then has a purpose. Uh, You know, a lot of people, they just get up in the morning, go to work, and go home, and they don't think about, you know, what good have I done today? What, what have I contributed uh, in some way to the greater good of mankind? Uh, those thoughts never even enter their, the, their mind. Uh, people today are, are greedy. Uh, they're self-serving. They are more interested in what's in it for me. Uh, and, you know, I'm not condemning the, the, all of mankind, but I'm just saying that, you know... <laughs> There's a trend. Uh, I think that uh, it's all about me, 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 uh, instant gratification. Uh, I don't want to work to, to attain uh, a goal. Uh, I want it given to me. Uh, the world owes me. The government owes me. My parents owe me. Whatever combination of those things, uh, you know, you, you, you just have to look at some of the things that are going on uh, on college campuses and all that to see, uh, you know, like a barometer of, of the attitudes that a lot of the young people carry. Now, again, I'm not condemning all young people. There are are definitely uh, a lot of young folks that have those good values, that have a purpose and meaning in life. They found it. They they've identified it. Uh, they work hard. Uh, I mean, for gosh sakes, the the kids that are going into the to the military right now are some of the 
they're some of the finest uh, examples of of what we can do uh, that have ever existed. They're bright. They're intelligent. Uh, they've they've chosen to take that path, the path of a warrior, to to potentially sacrifice their life to uh, to a greater cause. Uh, I know that the you know we always we always want to say that you know the the old guard was tougher or harder or uh, you know the rocks were heavier and heavier in those days. Uh, I got it. I'm that way too. But the young folks that do uh, make the right choices and and live by these ideals that are going into the military and, and joining, uh, you know, I mean, honest, the special forces guys we have, the Navy SEALs, the the, the top tier guys that are out there right now, they're as good as, as they ever were, if not better. So we're doing something right, but there's still a lot of work left to do. And, you know, that's why I read those rules today. Uh, that's, that's what I live by. Uh, that's what I've tried to instill in my family. And that's what we, uh, believe that anyone who becomes a member of the Order of the Black Shamrock uh, needs to uphold those standards. And, uh, you know, those came from from uh, the ideas that were put forth back in the, uh, in the Middle Ages when, uh, you know, you had, you had people that were trained, uh, uh, trained warriors, trained killers, uh, you know, masters of mayhem. And in order for people to... Uh, keep that in check all like i've said before in previous podcasts all warriors have to live by a code because if the warrior doesn't live by a code a code of of morality and honesty and integrity uh then you're no you're no better than the than the terrorist you're no better than the bad guy uh you're no better than the people doing evil because uh you you've got this terrible force this incredible power the ability to create and destroy and uh that needs to be held to a to a higher standard uh, and we've always had those codes for our, for our warriors. And the thing is that those codes need to be for all of us. They need to be, uh, in place for, uh, fathers and mothers who, who can pass those things down to their kids as, as examples of, of right and just behavior. So anyway, um, waxing on a little bit here about this, but I'm very passionate about it. I believe that it has given me purpose and cause, uh, and it's something that I think about all the time. Uh, I have daily conversations with my family. Uh, I have a 17-year-old son now. We talk about these very things almost every single day because we still, uh, go back and forth to school and, and, you know, those are times when he and I can have these solo conversations and all that. And I, I'm doing everything I can to make sure that, that he understands uh, that there's more to life than uh, uh, paycheck. Uh, there's more to life than having your name up in the lights. Uh, there's more to life than how many likes or retweets you get on those uh, social media platforms. So anyway, uh, that brings us right up to medieval combat. Renaissance Combat with Mr. John Clements. Well, folks, uh, good morning. And today we have a special guest on, uh, someone who is uh, from a completely different uh, world, if you will, than a lot of the stuff that we've talked about uh, because he comes at it from uh, a historical standpoint and uh, from the Western world standpoint. But there's a lot... uh, there's a lot of cool stuff, and uh, I'll tell you what, if you've ever watched any movies that showed uh, medieval combat and swordsmanship, uh, of course, everyone's seen Lord of the Rings, so they saw all of the sword play in there. John has some real insights onto what's movies and what's real, and he's a devoted uh, a greater part of his uh, adult life to uh, sifting through that and... Uh, basically uh, bringing the truth of the matter in medieval combat, swordsmanship, daggers, uh, hand-to-hand combat, wrestling. So uh, it, it's real interesting today. I've known John for quite a few years, uh, and uh, he's he's a controversial guy because he doesn't pull any punches and he's a no-shitter. So we're going to start right off by saying good morning, John. Uh, glad to have you here. Good morning. Thank you, Ernest. Happy to be here. 
Excellent. And John, I need to introduce uh, my uh, producer, uh, Danny T. He's here also. So, Hi, John. Nice to meet you. Hi, producer Danny. <laughs> well, John, I'm going to start out with just a couple questions because I know uh, you're, you're well known in your field and in your world. Uh, a lot of the guys that are going to be listening to this probably aren't aware of that. They're just not uh, in touch with that uh, particular uh, subject matter. So I'm going to ask you just a few questions. Uh, uh, it, it basically, it's like, who is John Clemens? Just uh, Clemens. Uh, just kind of tell me where you're from, your childhood, those kind of things. So we just get a start here. Well, I grew up in central Florida, and I had been playing with swords literally since kindergarten. In Florida, we have um, palmetto bushes, and they grow into natural sword-like blade shapes, their mm -hmm. branches. So I had just been playing with them literally since kindergarten. And by the time I was about 12, I had lost so many friends by hitting them in the hands that my dad made me a bunch of wooden swords and wooden shields. Mm -hmm. And so that made a big difference. Uh, wasn't hurting people with just any stick I could find anymore. <laughs> and then I, I took sport fencing lessons when I was 14 and uh, dabbled in uh, Asian martial arts, but uh, never attended any traditional classes or uh, took uh, lessons from anyone. And uh, by the time I was uh, in high school, I had started a medieval battling club, and we were uh, some of the pioneers using padded foam swords of different types. We went through all sorts of different uh, high-impact foams and different cores to make different types of padded weapons. And about the same time, I came across an organization called the Society for Creative Anachronism, a notorious um, historical role-playing uh, group whose motto is the Middle Ages, not as they were, but as they should have been, which tells you how historically accurate they are. But this organization is ubiquitous. They are everywhere. They're in virtually every country. I think they're even in Antarctica. And uh, they have done a tremendous amount to retard investigation and exploration and recovery into authentic European combat methods. And so having witnessed them, I said, wow, that's not how you would do it. That's wrong. And every time I asked anybody who was doing any type of uh, martial arts or sword play, uh, whether it was stunt fencing or uh, sport fencing, I asked them why they're doing it the way they're doing it. They could never answer. And when I would ask them how it was done historically, they couldn't answer. And a lot of Asian martial arts masters instructors would say to me, oh, you in the West have no martial arts. And I would say, that doesn't make sense. I'm looking at all these books on arms and armor. I visited the, the famous Kindbush collection in Philadelphia at their art museum in, um, I think it was 77, 78. It blew my mind. I bought my first book on arms and armor that day. Mm -hmm. and looked at that, the ingenious, gorgeous, sophisticated uh, beautiful weapons from the medieval and renaissance eras I said i cannot believe that we didn't have we our forebears yep. equally sophisticated methods for using these i mean here i am in high school studying about ancient rome and ancient greece and their military prowess and it doesn't make sense suddenly i'm i'm, I'm learning about western military methods have dominated the globe everyone follows our military methods based upon ballistics how did we not have martial arts? So I started to look into it. And in my senior year, I came across a book that was written in 1885, Egerton Castle's Schools and Masters of Defense from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance. This book had not been topped until the year 2000, when Dr. Sidney Anglo published his book, his seminal book, The Martial Arts of Renaissance Europe, Oxford University Press, 2000. I have that one. So for over 115 years, there was no book except for Egerton Castle's book. And Castle was fantastic, but like, he, like his fellow Victorian antiquarians, he viewed everything through the prism of modern sport fencing, of what you could do with oh, the foil, yeah. ape, and a military saber. They were clueless about martial arts. And I, I keep using that phrase, martial art. And here's something to tell your uh, listeners. The phrase martial art is an English term. They don't call it martial arts in Japan or Korea or China or Vietnam or the Philippines or what have you. 
Mm -hmm. It's an English term that comes from the French uh, art de martial, I think it is, um, which is from the Latin ars martialis, the arts of Mars, Roman god of war. Yep. And they were calling, and I've documented this, they were calling their fighting methods, their science of defense, they were calling it the martial arts as early as the 14th and 15th centuries. Oh, wow. It was only into the 17th century that they started to use the term to refer to military science. And, it, and it's used as a synonym for military science up until roughly the 1960s. And you know who brought the term back? Bruce Lee. Bruce uh, Lee brought it back because he didn't want to call his fighting style a particular style. So he generically referred to it as martial arts. Yeah. Prior to that, you can find very, very few references. Um, a couple around 1912, a couple in the 1890s where they will use the term martial art to refer to traditional Asian fighting disciplines. Mm -hmm. But um, I also have called it um, the science of defense. So what I study, the, the actual authentic medieval Renaissance fighting arts, they called it martial arts. They called it the science of defense. The, the Italian word is the science. And they call it science because they say it is based upon principles general principles that you can apply in the specific. The, the, the Latin term is uh, practicum et principia, principles in practice. They all called it the doctorum armorum, the doctrine of arm. In German, they called in, in German, it was known as the Kunstdefekte, the art of fighting. In Span Spain, it was sometimes called la destreza, the, the dexterity. It was also called um, the art battaglia, the art of battle, mm -hmm. the art Della Escrima, the art of fencing, um, the art gladiatoria, the art of combat. It had a dozen different names in a dozen different countries in Europe. And fortunately, they wrote down, and not just wrote, but illustrated their study guides, training manuals, and fighting treatises on this science of defense, on their martial arts, for about 350 years. So we have we actually have the most documented martial arts in human history, the medieval and renaissance martial arts. Its literature dwarfs all the rest of the world, the rest of the planet's literature on martial arts prior to the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Dwarfs compared to this. They were extremely systematic and scientific. For example, we have one book that's about 600 pages covering every form of fighting from ground grappling to knife fighting, daggers, staffs, stick fighting, fighting with farming implements, fighting in armor, fighting with long swords, fighting with all forms of pole arms, even fighting with the rapier, the musketeer sword. Hey, John. Uh, are, just I've never heard of this book, Ernest. They don't know it. And it comes in four different versions, full color, in Latin and German, <laughs> and nobody's heard of it. Well, I was going to ask you, uh, these books, now, it, it's funny because I didn't know they existed. And then I bought your books, which we'll talk about in a little bit, too. Uh, you have two books that, that basically, uh, I think one is Renaissance and one is Medieval. The, the first two that I that yeah. I ran across. And in that book, or the first book, the medieval one, I think you referenced some of those, uh, I think you referenced one called Codex Wallenstein and things, or I don't know what they were, but I went out and tried to find some of them. Some of them you are tough to find. So my question to you is, these books that you're describing now, are they available to the average guy without having to go to a museum? And, and Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, what we did back in the 90s is we started to dig these things up, following the old sources of Egerton Castle back in 1885, because he was the first guy to go and look at these books and say, I know what the myths are and the legends and the folklore about sport fencing and how fencing came about, but what was the reality? So he was one of the first guys to actually go and find the old books and actually start studying them and reconstructing their methods and practicing them and teaching them. And he had an entire club that was doing this all the way up to about 1914. Mm -hmm. Yet this whole generation of students wiped out in the trenches of the Great War. Oh, yeah. So for about another 60 years, you had nobody looking at this material until <clears throat> roughly the 1980s when you had some some choreographers starting to dabble in it and they started to write on it in the 90s 
So here I am, I'm in the 90s, and I'm getting Xerox copies of it that people have smuggled out of museums and libraries and <laughs> monasteries. And we're looking at what Castle found. And there was a guy who wrote on it briefly in the 1960s, um, called, a book called um, The History and Art of Personal Combat. And uh, so he dabbled on it. But it wasn't until Dr. Anglo said, hey, I see what you're doing. And I'm doing that from an academic point of view. So we had been putting this stuff online since 1996. My website, thearma.org, has been online since 96. And uh, we've been putting it on there. Mm -hmm. And when Dr. Anglo's book came out, we finally had a, a scholar, an academic, who was taking this stuff seriously. And since then, in the last 15 years, the subject has exploded, and virtually all of these are available online. And I've got an entire bookshelf of translated published works that did not exist, a, a whole genre of literature that did not exist uh, until about the year 97, 98, when I published my two books. Mm -hmm. Now, my books were obsolete by about 2001, even to me. And I'm not a I'm not a translator. I'm not a uh, I don't transcribe this material. I don't translate it. I, I integrate it when other people translate it. Okay. But the translation process is very very slow, and even when it's translated, you have to then interpret it. Mm -hmm. Then after you interpret it, you have to practice it. Then after you practice it, you better damn well master it. But today, you've got every month, there's some group of adolescents that will form a club or an association, put up a website, make some T-shirts, buy some of these books, get some equipment, and they're off and running. And uh, it's kind of like, imagine if, if you had never heard of something called jujitsu or kung fu, mm -hmm. and suddenly you found a couple old books, and it didn't exist. It wasn't extant anymore. It went extinct. And you found these books, and you're looking at these books. You know you, they couldn't possibly put the entire art in those books. Yeah. But these guys did a pretty damn good job of it because they actually will say to us things like, here is, here is my book for you who do not have a master for you to study alone from. Or here is my book. Now remember, you cannot learn perfectly from a book as you can in person. But – through words and pictures, we will structure it for you so that you can begin and that you can learn these secrets. That's pretty powerful stuff. And it's part of Western civilization, Western society, that we take all of our arts and sciences and put them into the form of books, of literature, whether it's math, <laughs> cooking, botany, what have you. We did the very same thing for our arts of defense. And the only thing that made it go away was when we started going bang at each other. Yeah. Once the firearms come into, way, into play, the old masters of defense fade, the schools of defense fade, and the only thing remaining, the only thing left over, are the aristocrats with their small swords, their car mm -hmm. and tennis weapons for dueling, and of course simple military sabers and cutlasses, which is a very rudimentary retrograde form of fighting. It's very crude. That in the, in the single stick or back sorting, very simplistic type of fencing. And then you have the modern art, which is not even doesn't even qualify as a legitimate martial art. And I don't even consider it a legitimate form of swordsmanship because you're fencing with one arm. You don't make body contact and you, there's no uh, unarmed techniques involved. And there's no two handed techniques. There's no double weapon techniques. Mm -hmm. There's no arms, there's no shields, there's no daggers. That's modern sport fencing. And if you understand that today's stunt fencers, theatrical fencers, stage combat fencers, choreographers, fight directors, they have for, the, for some 60, 70 years now been making it up. They're faking it. That's their job, to fake it. Yep. And the role-playing societies, they dress up and they pretend it. But none of them really knows what the it is is that they're doing you can't fake it or pretend it if you have not recovered it hmm. and then mastered it or at least been practicing it so my argument has been that i'm the it <laughs> i've been the it for um 18 years now professionally mm -hmm. and started teaching it publicly in 92 
But I really, I consider that my start was really not until about 2004. In 2004, I made some tremendous, absolutely tremendous breakthroughs into these teachings, how they were taught, how they were practiced, and how we can study them again today uh, as a direct result of the work of Dr. Anglo and, and my students. And because of that, everything that we're doing is pretty much today standard operating procedure within what is called the HEMA community, H-E-M-A, Historical European Martial Arts, a term that I believe I coined back in 98. I also coined the term MARCA, M-A-R-C-A, Medieval and Renaissance Combat Arts. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, but So I sometimes will use the term MARCA. I don't prefer the term HEMA. Uh, it's not specific of the period that we actually have all this authentic material from. And I also will use the term MARE, M-A-R-E, MARE, meaning Martial Arts of Renaissance Europe. Both of them acronyms, neologisms, as they're called. And uh, because when someone says to me, what's your martial arts style? I can't go, yes. (laughs) No, your martial arts style. Yes, exactly. Martial arts. I can't do that. I have to identify it. Everyone looks for a name. So I I have to come up with something. So people will say Marka or, or Mara. You know, it's funny you say that because Bruce uh, Lee, who you brought up, and uh, I, I come down from that lineage. Uh, he had the same problem. He had to call it something because, uh, you know, it, people need to have something they can wrap their head around. Now, let me let me clarify one thing or have you clarify one thing. Uh, the time period that you are talking about, when you say Renaissance versus mis- medieval and things like that, can you set those time frames in reference just so the average guy who might not be a historian – knows what yes. what's a great the question. a great question I, I i get asked that whether i'm teaching um or demonstrating or, or lecturing at a museum or at an elementary school that very question comes up and the simple answer is that um in the renaissance starting about uh the 1300s but going into the 1400s we have a different renaissance in different subjects at different times in different regions of Western Europe. So that the renaissance in painting and the renaissance in architecture and the renaissance in, say, um, math or, or exploration or in fighting arts doesn't begin at the same time everywhere. Mm-hmm. But essentially what you have is um, – you have a search for old knowledge of the Greeks and the Romans, Greco-Roman knowledge. They start digging for that knowledge. And the reason they start digging for it is because of the Mongols. (laughs) Those damn Mongols, they come up all the time. (laughs) What happens is the Mongol peace allows for the spice trade. Europeans get a taste for it. Then when the Mongol Empire collapses, the Persians and the uh, Arabs go, no more spice unless you come through us. And the Europeans go, "Uh uh-uh, we're not paying those prices. Let's find an alternate route through them, around them or in the other direction. And let's go look at all the old maps. So they go digging through everything. And as they're digging through old maps, they find other old books and they begin to say, hey, wait a minute. The medieval church and the medieval feudal structure is not the entire universe. These Greeks and Romans had fantastic ideas about law, government, citizenship, um, marriage, um, military. Mm -hmm. Wow. And it changes everything. And, of course, the plagues reduce the population so that the individual is now more valuable. So you have the decline of the feudal system, the rise of a, of a merchant class, an artisan class, a middle class, uh, bankers. You have um, citizen armies now, and you have militias, not just the knight and his men at arms. Mm-hmm. And this is the Renaissance. Now, what happens is in the Renaissance, they actually realize they're in the Renaissance. They actually look around and go, wow, this isn't like it was in ancient times. It's not that period between ancient time and now, that Middle Ages, wink, wink, the plages. That's the medieval period, and we're not medieval anymore. We're in the Renaissance, buddy. And so they knew this. They were self-aware of it, and that only encouraged them to um, do a lot more. So sometimes you'll hear it said that um, the Irish monks helped recover Western civilization by 
gathering, saving all this material from the Greeks and Romans. Mm -hmm. And other times you'll hear it said that it was Jewish scholars that translated Arabic works. But as they were translating it from Arabic, they said, wait a minute, we're not translating this from Arabic or Persian we're into Latin or Greek. We're translating it back into Latin and Greek. This yeah. wasn't knowledge. This was this was the Greek and Roman stuff. So it, it changes their perspective. Okay. What happens is, is what Dr. Anglo discovered is that they had a renaissance in their self-defense methods as they got away from wearing coats of chain mail mm -hmm. and fight with big shields. And they started to develop the articulated plate armor. They started to discard the large shields and use two-handed weapons. And that allowed them to do a lot more grappling and wrestling. Then the firearms come on the scene. The armor starts to decline. But the firearms actually perfect the plate armor. Before the plate armor goes away, it's perfected mm -hmm. as a result of the threat of firearms. Hmm. And then um, as it goes away, as armor declines and goes away, there is a renewed interest in urban self-defense, not just fighting on the battlefield in formations or on horseback or in heavy armor, but fighting on the street, in the pub, in the back alley. And then by about 14, excuse me, 1547, um, judicial combat goes away. Judicial combat is essentially outlawed. It takes about a generation or so, but it's outlawed. And now that you don't have judicial combat, explain explain judicial combat. Trial by combat. Trial by combat. Okay. You claim I slept with my mother-in-law. I challenge you to a duel. We're going to settle it by combat because there's there's no way to settle it because as as knights as 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 nobles. We can't have a trial by a jury or a sovereign, so we fight it out, and God will decide who's the victor. <laughs> and and they kind of knew that didn't always happen. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And um, so to to do away with that, they they did it eventually. It goes away, and the result is well. Now, how do we settle our differences? You insulted me, and you didn't apologize. I want to call you out, or you accuse me of a crime, and I want to clear my name. How? Do all you out. And the only way to do it is a private duel of honor. So now we're going to go about back behind the 7-Eleven at dawn. You just you and me and a friend mm -hmm. show up with seven guys. Then I take both of you out and I tell whatever story I want. So <laughs> to prevent that, the private duel is only semi private. You know, it's like they're mm -hmm. going to duel, pass it along, you know. And so you want you want <clears throat> some this is, but you don't want public interference from the authorities. And that, that, um, that dueling right stays with the aristocracy all the way up to about World War I. And World War I basically kills off the whole dueling mentality and the honor culture of Western civilization. Yeah. So that period of the Renaissance, they're right, they're pub they now publishing, they're now publishing. I'll wrap this up by simply saying they start to print and publish their books. And some of them are gorgeously illustrated, and they have never been equaled in terms of how they display human violent movement, the motionality, the, sh the shifting balance, and the technical precision in which they describe their fighting methods, their self-defense methods, mm -hmm. starting with grappling and wrestling, but going through every type of weapon. And this is the literature that was lost. These are the secret martial arts. These are the martial arts you can't really find that nobody – there's no living lineage despite what some people might claim. There yeah. is no living lineage. Your modern sport fencing coaches, your masters at arms, they don't know about anything except for how to win points in an artificial regulated game yeah. using, using make-believe weapons. So what we started doing is – we looked at only the original sources. We studied only with uh, accurate replica weapons and replica training weapons that they used at the time. We try and use similar clothing when it's appropriate. We do uh, target cutting with sharp versions, sharp replicas. And then we examine the authentic arms and armor as, as closely as we can, as often as we can, and I'm one of the few people, the few individuals on the planet who have ever been able to get 
at collections, private collections of antique weapons from the medieval Renaissance eras mm -hmm. and train with them to not just examine them and handle them, but to sweat with them and even cut with them. And then I take that knowledge and I compare it to how the modern replicas are made and how they perform and handle, which mm -hmm. most of the time is abysmally. And uh, then I take that information and I process it through what I'm studying in the source teachings. And you add that to now I'm going on four decades of investigating this material. But as I said, only about 14 years of seriously, really confidently saying we know how they fought, what they did. And we have over 130 fight manuals, study guides and training books to base it on and mm -hmm. to end by bringing it back to Bruce Lee. Bruce said that he based his Jeet Kune Do on three sources, Wing, Wing Chun, Western boxing, Western fencing. Well, Western boxing, Western fencing are, are combat sports. Yeah. Combat sport. If he were alive today, he'd be studying Renaissance martial arts. I have no doubt of it. Well, you know what? It's, since you touched on that, uh, one of the things that I've always uh, – there's two questions. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask them both. Uh, hopefully we'll get, get to them. Uh, is in the Oriental, let's say, Eastern systems uh, – it seemed that when you said there is no – people had said you have no martial art you know, or, or legacy. And I'm thinking, for God's sakes, the, from, the, from all the way back, as far as you can go in Europe, if you will, uh, there were armies, there were soldiers, there were weapons, uh, all the way up through the Crusades and everything else when we clashed with the, with the Mideast uh, and, the, and their weapons and things like that. Because I think every time you – uh, that these cultures clashed in both uh, social and or uh, military conflicts, if you will, uh, that there was a sharing and a learning process that kind of went was a two-way street. But the what happened, I think, and, and maybe you can clarify this, why the hell did everybody think that the, the samurai and the oriental martial arts were superior to what we had uh, in our life and death combat history that, that was going on, you know, also. And then uh, a question, and I don't know if this is even a legitimate question or not, but there must have been a time when Western soldiers uh, confronted samurais. And, <laughs> you know, I, I'm curious because it's like, okay, who would win, a samurai or, or a, you okay. know, a medieval soldier? So if you can just kind of, yeah. if you want, brief on a little bit of that stuff. That, that is all a fascinating topic. I'm actually publishing on that topic in the future. And um, everything you said is encapsulated um, already in a number of interesting anecdotes, stories, and, uh, and lectures. First of all, um, we know that in the West, we had heavy infantry expertise going all the way back to the Greeks. Uh, all you have to do is look at the Spartans and Thermopylae. Yeah. Alexander the Great takes um, the Greeks all the way to India, um, northern India, that whole region of the world. Afghanistan. Even. Yes. And he's doing it at the head of an army, an army, I think, 20 percent of which are Spartans, people that make samurai look like Girl Scouts. <laughs> Everywhere he went, he brought Greek Greek arithmetic, Greek cooking, Greek sculpture, Greek um, art everywhere. What? He didn't leave behind Greek military ab knowledge and ability? Of course he did. And it's been suggested that within a 30-year period of him ending up over there in Nepal, you have the legend of the Bodhidharma taking Kung Fu to China. Oh, curious coincidence. Mm -hmm. I'm of the Oh, that's interesting. I, I got where you're going with that. I'm of the opinion that martial arts uh, spring up indigenously around the world. Yeah. But it is a, curi a, curi a curiosity. I, I have an image of a Babylonian um, relief carving where the two guys are fighting with knives and one of them is kneeing the other in the groin. The other one is stepping on the other guy's foot. And the first one is reaching up and grabbing his hair while he's plunging his knife into his belly. These are fighting techniques. And there it is. And it's about, I, I want to guess, 5,000 years old. Mm -hmm. Have of course the uh, the Egyptian um, uh, what is it Beni Hassan uh, the wall paintings 
mm-hmm. showing the Egyptian stick fighting and wrestling techniques from about four or five, six thousand years ago. And then, of course, you have the Romans known for their fighting skills, um, t- turning it into an entire culture in the arena. So, well, they had no- they had training schools for gladiators, and and I mean, we we kind of all know about that, but you know, that had to be a systematic uh, schedule of training for both physical fitness and or all of those crazy weapons that they used because they they did some some strange stuff too but someone had to be in charge of training that that's a martial art that's a system we we know their their trainers were called the doctore or doctor you know so Mm -hmm. that's where you get the phrase doctor as being someone who is learned because he was the doctore and then the owner of the school was known as the lenista but the thing about gladiators that gladiators are not these super awesome killing machine terminators they're sportsmen they're showmen Mm-hmm. And, and their skill lies in bleeding the man and prolonging the fight till they need to end uh-huh. it and to making large operatic movements that can be seen by the crowd. By the crowd. Yeah, if you're a super badass killing Terminator, you're not going to be a very popular gladiator. Yeah. So there's that those elements to consider. Hollywood has concocted this myth that the gladiators, two men enter, one man leaves. Well, then – Geez, you're going to have a, a very short career. You're not going to recruit many people, and you're not going to train people very long. But uh, anyway, you have yep. uh, the Greeks had a uh, system of dueling. The, uh, the the Norse had a system of dueling. Curiously, their names are fam- are similar. In Greece, it was known as homomachia, single combat, man to man combat. And in the, in the uh, Scandinavian culture, it was called um, uh, home ganga. Very similar oh, wow. words, and we know that the Vikings traveled all the way down to the the region of uh, of the Byzant- Byzantines oh, and yeah. East North Africa. So they might have picked up some of this idea, and the very the very notion of knighthood of the idea of knighthood is actually a fusion of the Greco Roman citizen soldier with the Germanic Celtic Scandinavian idea of the lone warrior the 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 tribal warrior the supreme tribal warrior it is the fusion of those two martial cultures which actually produces knighthood Mm -hmm. and then it is the the merging of christendom with greco-roman humanism that produces chivalry so anyway so we do have this massive martial heritage um you mentioned the Crusades. Well, the the, uh, the Saracens referred to the Crusaders of as men of iron, and they warned, "Do not engage them in close combat, for our weapons are not effective against their armor, mm-hmm. and they kill you." So they stayed away and shot them with arrows. Yeah, the Mongols did the same thing. Um, but then, bringing it back to the Japanese and the samurai, it's only in the 20th century, really, that we get this myth. That the samurai are these supermen that conquered the world. And they actually didn't conquer the world. They, they, they got their asses handed to them when they went to Korea and fought people that were using basically the same arms and armor. Mm-hmm. They uh, didn't do very well against the Mongols who filled them with arrows. <laughs> and um, the thing is, most people are unaware that Renaissance era Europeans were in Japan for almost 90 years during the golden age of Japanese martial arts. They first encountered, the the Portuguese encountered the Japanese in India, where the the Japanese were forbidden to come ashore with their weapons because the Indians were complaining that they were slaughtering people every time they gave them a dirty look. They would Uh just kill them. But they encountered them there. That's where they found out about the Japangos, and they went to find Japan. They also found Okinawa first, and nobody came running back with karate, did they? No. So they're in Japan from the 1540s to the 1630s. And they're not just Portuguese. It's Spanish, Portuguese, English, Russian, Dutch, French. They have pretty mixed crews. They even brought Africans, black Africans with them. Mm -hmm. And there's an account of one uh, Portuguese ship captain touring the whole Nagasaki province prefecture mm-hmm. with an entourage of um, of black halberdiers, and they were ta- they were taken to dinner 
at the daimyo's residence, at his castles. And they came back to the ship and they go, what happened? They said, we, um, we got to party, we got, dr- we got to drink, we got laid. It was a blast. <laughs> daimyos, the daimyos were all competing to get the attention of these different ship captains and show, show off their, their troops. Mm-hmm. Um, we also have an event called the Affair of the Madre Deus. The Affair of the, the, the Madre Deus. It's a ship that's, um, I believe it's known as a skip. It's sm- larger than a Corvette, smaller than a frigate. Mm-hmm. The ship captain anchored it off the bay in Nagasaki, and the daimyo uh, ordered it seized. And he said, you want it, you come and get it, shades of Thermopylae. Mm-hmm. So the Japanese couldn't get their boats out that far in the harbor because the waves are too choppy. He anchored it far off. Okay. So he ends up fighting against 2,500 samurai and bushi, not just foot soldiers, not peasants, actual samurai. The guy, the guy cannot take the ship. And they keep writing about how they get to the ship. They try and board it. And his halberdiers and his sword and buckler men and his crossbow men are defeating these people and even mocking them. And at one point, they, dar- they darkened the ship when it was attacked at night. And when the samurai tried to board it, they suddenly opened up all the lanterns and rang all these bells and drums and made a huge noise and and slaughtered the next wave. And this went on for five days until the daimyo ordered another 2,500 reinforcements. Mm -hmm. They attack his ship by taking small boats and connecting them together and building siege towers on them and (laughs) the siege towers with wet hide and putting their own Ashigari gunners in the towers to shoot at the captain. Mm -hmm. Eventually, long story short, um, they board the ship and the captain goes to the next deck and he somehow is able to blow the top deck with grenades. And, um, that, you know, the hand grenades from the old cartoons that look like a ball with a wick in it. Oh yeah. That's where you get a Han grenade from, a Han grenade, a hand grenade, okay? Yeah. So they, somebody had one of those, and he got shot, and he drops it, and it blows the next deck. And the captain ends up realizing the ship is lost, so he scuttles it, and the ship goes down. So how do we know this story? Because the Japanese themselves chronicled the affair. Wow. They chronicled the battle, and they were so impressed with the, the fight and the fact that the guy wouldn't surrender, that they in immaculate detail wrote about it. And this battle is actually depicted dramatically in James Clavell's famous novel, Shogun. Mm-hmm. If you remember the miniseries oh, they yeah. did? Yep. Battle is taken from this battle. Oh, wow. There's also, also many incidents where the Japanese encountered Spanish and Portuguese swordsmen. Have you heard about these accounts? I have not. I wonder why not. <laughs> but I've heard all about Musashi. With all due respect, believe me, because I've come from that world, uh, we're not putting anybody down here. We're just trying to sort out some historical well, I, legacy and, and facts well, here. I, so, I mean, to suspect that if, if the Europeans were easily defeated, that we would have heard about it by now. <laughs> we would have had our noses rubbed in it. But instead, we have this one uh, incident where this Portuguese captain writes in his journal, up until now, the, J- the Japangos, as he refers to them, the Japangos have known us only as priests and merchants. But after today, they know us to be warriors. What happened? Some of his drunk guys got into a scuffle outside of a bar, and the samurai said, oh, no, you don't. And they killed the samurai. And he wrote about it. Wow. Well, about three weeks later, the guy who caused the affair was found on the side of the road with his head removed. Yeah. So they ambushed him and took him out. But there's many incidents like this, and I'm, um, I can happily say that they were chronicled by a, a Portuguese scholar of Japan in the 20th century, and I've been able to get his material, and it's a gold mine, a fascinating gold mine. At one point, you're not going to believe this, but at one point – A Japanese warlord was planning to invade Formosa 
using Portuguese ships and soldiers to ferry his Japanese samurai Mm -hmm. to Formosa so they could invade it, take it over, and use it as a staging ground for a mutual invasion and conquest of China. Yeah. That's how ignorant they were about, you know, that part of the world. They didn't know what was Formosa was. They didn't know what China was. But they were planning on doing this together. Portugal and Japan shall conquer and rule. And and, uh, he promised them that they could convert everyone to Christianity. Now, another incident that did happen is that the Portuguese, with their samurai allies, attacked a Spanish fortress in the Philippines that was itself defended by the Spanish, their Filipino allies, and their Japanese Waco allies. So you have Portuguese and Japanese versus Spanish, Japanese, and Philippines. Filipinos, all in, that would have been a hell of a fight. <laughs> yeah. There also was a combined English-Dutch ship that um, a se- besieged an island and went, as- went ashore and defeated a large group of Waco that had been made up of a group of samurai that after Sigigahara had to flee. And they were holding up on this island and they were r- ravaging the area, mm-hmm. ravaging, you know, be- doing the whole pirate thing. And the uh, Dutch went in and, and just, you know, what defeated them. You know, so you're talking like... Two, two, one shipload, two shiploads of, of soldiers, not even, I mean, we're talking sailors, sailors, not even hardcore soldiers, and they were able to um, to do okay. And it's not because they're lining up and firing muskets yeah. in, you know, at this period. Well, so, I, think, I think it's important uh, to, to, to kind of delineate two things here. Number one, uh, we did have a martial art, uh, and I believe that it's probably – safe to say that a lot of times it depends on in individual combat it depends on the the skill of the individual combatants in other words a very very good western trained guy against a weak uh oriental trained if you will or vice versa a a highly skilled samurai against a, a a peasant who had a sword in his hand from portugal or something you could say you know it comes down to to the individual but when it comes down to style against style, all other things being equal, uh, it would be very safe to say that we were as equal uh, in, in, in systems or skills or weapons craft, if you will, to the, to the much vaunted samurai. And again, I got it. It's, it's whoever speaks the loudest and gets the most press. Uh, you're going to be the most famous. So, and it's cool, I think, also, John, uh, and I'll let you talk in a sec here. I think we... As a culture or people as a, as a psychological uh, aspect, we always think the grass is greener on the other side. Oh, that's from the Far East. It must be superior. And yeah. I think we've fallen prey to that. Mystic, esoteric, it's mysterious, it's foreign, yes. And since we in the West have a tradition of um, getting rid of our traditions, we have a yes. tradition mm-hmm. of advancing and progressing, whereas in Asia their tradition is to preserve. So when you have Admiral Perry goes and opens up Japan, he is encountering Mm -hmm. literally a medieval society. I mean, it is frozen in amber like Mm -hmm. the mosquitoes in Jurassic Park, whereas we abandoned or progressed past our medieval time, our Middle Ages, our Renaissance era hundreds of years earlier. So um, in the 17th century, a um, a Dutch traveler, I forget his name, in Japan, one of the very few Europeans who's ever in Japan in the 18th century. Did I say 17th? I meant 18th. Okay. 18th century. He um, visits a, a temple and the priests ask to, to have their swords. So he and his companions hand over their skinny little small swords, which are like little car antenna weapons. Mm-hmm. A very vicious, mm-hmm. nasty tool if you don't know how to fight it. Don't underestimate it. Yeah. But – it was not a weapon that came into being because it was beating other weapons. Right? It's strictly for gentlemen dueling, mm-hmm. gentlemen self-defense. All right. um, well, he borrows all their swords, ties like three or four of them up in a ribbon, puts them down on the ground on a stand, and then he takes his katana and cuts through the swords. And this Dutch guy writes, oh, my God, he's severed our swords like they were paper. Oh, his swords are fantastic. They're incredible. 
All right. Well, back up uh, 150 years, the Portuguese are writing in their journals. They're detailing and documenting every single thing they see in Japan. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything. Mm -hmm. They're documenting how the Japanese blow their nose. Why? Because they blow their nose on tissue paper, rice paper. As opposed to us. (laughs) And the Europeans are going, oh, my God, that's paper. Do you know how valuable that is? You know, and, and th- you're just throwing it away. And the Japanese are like, knock yourself out. And he, Can I have that? Oh, my God, thanks. All right. So they're documenting everything. Do you think that the Japanese were hiding their martial arts? No. They were coming out in front of the Europeans and displaying it and going, ta-da. And the Europeans are going, yeah, uh-huh, that's nice. Why? Why are they not impressed? Because there's, they're not seeing anything they don't have in spades back home. Yeah. And in fact, mm. they remark that the Japanese have inferior armor, inferior cavalry, inferior horses, and, and cannot muster or deploy troops properly. Whoa! Uh, later on, the shogun is gifted a box of lead soldiers by this Portuguese admiral soldiers of pike and musket soldiers showing him and the shogun is shown how to how the Europeans deploy their nations yeah so um at one point one of them writes in his journal the Japanese have wonderful lacquered wear, lacquer wear and wonderful detailed art artwork and they have some fine sabels sabers sabels that they call katans and they shall they shall fetch us a, a pretty price in Bangkok and Manila. Oh, my God. They weren't even they're, bringing them home. They're collecting these katanas, and they're selling them in Bangkok and Manila. They're not going, get this back to the queen. We must adopt this. <laughs> they're going, yeah, we're going to sell these. And what's funny is in the 20th century, where, where were the two leading places that were the manufacturers of faux katanas? Yeah. Thailand and the Philippines. Yeah. Funny. So anyway, um, in the 19th century, a Russian sailor writes about visiting Japan, and he says, and I got to see this katana, and surely it was the finest and sharpest sword on the planet. And I said, wait a minute, who is this Russian sailor that he can declare this? Has he ever handled um, a 15th century uh, Spanish falcata or uh, a 16th century um, uh, Castilian side sword or um, a 15th century German great sword? No, he hasn't. In fact, he writes in his diary that he left the farm at age 19 and never, never set foot off the ship since then. So he's completely unqualified as a swordsman, armorer, armsmith, bladesmith, fencer, anything mm-hmm. to be judging katanas. And that same phenomena is repeated in the 20th century when you have soldiers, GIs, picking up swords after the war and bringing them home yeah. and comparing them to machetes and bowie knives. Or you have museum curators who have never examined a pristine European blade, let alone cut with it, let alone trained with it. And they're seeing a katana that has been purposely sharpened so that it can literally shave the hair off your arm. Great. That's that's wonderful. That's an impressive display of the polisher and of the metallurgy. But you take that blade into battle and it's going to get fucked instantly. And we have an account from the 16th century where these two samurai say to each other, they're having tea, and they say, tomorrow is the battle. Let us go out into the garden and strike the table of soft sand that has been placed there so that we may dull our blades so that they will not fail in the battle. Now, I asked a polisher about that. And I asked the the bladesmith, the late bladesmith, Paul Champagne, who forged the famous katana for Toshishiro Obata that won a cutting contest. Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, of course. You put a super fine edge on that and it contacts another blade. It's chipped. Katanas are known for chipping, but nobody tells you that. And when you see them cutting bamboo and straw mats, that's nice. But now cut something solid. Now let it encounter the metal and then let us examine the edge. I demonstrated on PBS Nova's Secrets of the Viking Sword program. I demonstrated with a katana, just an off-the-shelf model. I cut a straw mat and then I cut the exact same straw mat using a blunt war sword, a European bastard sword, Mm -hmm. a 
replica. And I cut the same thing. I also have a video online of me cutting five inches of bamboo using that same sword. I also have cut through a four inch pine sapling with that same sword. And I show the sword is completely unsharpened. It's well honed, it's hardened, but and its, its edge is designed to encounter plate armor and to encounter metal rimmed shields, something the katanas weren't designed to do. The Japanese are fighting themselves for 600 years on their island. They develop an excellent sword that maximizes the little bit of steel that they have available to them. Yeah. It cuts, it slices, it dices, it makes julienne fries, it's good on foot and horseback, <laughs> armored, unarmored, great. But it's not the universal cosmic sword. And when the Europeans encounter it, they're going, we have these back home, essentially. We have gross sabels, we have gross messers, we have langen messers, huge, broad, single-age, curved swords, and we've had these since the ancient Greeks. Even the Vikings had these. But the, Euro the Japanese had never seen side swords and rapiers and mm. two hanging hilted great swords. So they're encountering things they had not encountered. And then there's this little bit of fact. The Portuguese documented the average height of the average Japanese warrior. Do you know what it was? I'm going to guess 5'3". Five, 5'1 five, to 5'2". Oh, wow. If you go and visit a collection of Japanese armor, yeah. period, you'll think you're in the children's set. Hmm. They're tiny. And then and then I have um, the, the book from 1910, I believe it is, Harrison's uh, book about uh, his time in Japan studying kendo and kenjutsu. Mm -hmm. And he's only 5'9", and in the photos, he's towering he towers. above the entire class. Now, I believe it was the U.S. Army in 1942 did a study of the average height of the average Japanese 19-year-old. Do you know what it was? No, I don't. 5'5". Five, five. Do you know what the height of the average Japanese 19-year-old is today? I do not. 5'7 and a half. I believe that's taller than you and I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm right at 5'7 myself. 5'7. Yeah. Okay, so... Why the difference? Well, obviously nutrition. Yeah. Most of the time, it's what I'm doing right now, what you're doing right now. You're, we're both sitting in chairs. They have been sitting in chairs since the 19th century. They're no longer sitting in that Caesar position that cuts off blood flow and stunts your growth. Oh. And they're no longer wearing sandals with a cord between their toes, which turn your feet to this position and help your legs become bow-legged. Instead, they're wearing modern shoes. Mm -hmm. So they wear modern shoes at the office. They wear modern shoes out to dinner. They wear modern shoes when they're doing their sports. They sit in chairs and on the subway. They sit in chairs in theaters. They sit in chairs in the office. They sit in chairs in front of their Nintendos and their PS4s. They're sitting just like we are, mm -hmm. and they have a, a more westernized diet. So this accounts... So don't take my word for it. In the documentary film, Reclaiming the Blade, which I co-wrote and um, appear in, uh, there is a samurai master who says in Japan, in, in Japanese, uh, a very elderly master, he says, quote, I fear my art will die out with me, for today's Japanese youth do not move like their ancestors. Ooh. But I tell you, Ernest, when I have a guy who comes into in, my uh, school of arms and he's six foot four and he says to me, eh, 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 he bows at the door. I say, stop right there. Go out and come back in, because in our culture, in our civilization, we don't bow. George Washington did away with it. Yeah. Don't bow. We shake hands. OK, which is the ancient sign of I am unarmed and yep. uh, don't, you know, free hand. So he comes in and he tells me, oh, I've studied a classical kinjitsu. And I say, no, you haven't. He says, yes, I have. And I go, no, you haven't. You've studied the amalgam modern westernized version, which even the Japanese themselves are mostly studying. And um, he says, no, that's not true. And I go, how tall are you? 6'5", six, 6'4"? Six, okay. How big is your katana? That's not a classical katana size. You have a modern westernized katana. You don't have the, the centronus gravitas center of gravity, gravity as the 16th century renaissance masters called it center of gravity they invented the term hmm. 
He doesn't have the center of gravity of a 16th or 15th century Japanese guy, let alone a 14th century Okinawan farmer. So you're not built like them, and you're studying a style that's built for somebody else's ancestors to fight someone else's ancestors with someone else's ancestors' weapons. So I'm going to show you a system that your ancestors developed, and our ancestors came in all different shapes and sizes. They're from, you know, a, a Spaniard is not a Northern German. Yeah. Uh, a Scotsman is not a Frenchman. And so you have the master Yoka Meyer in 1570 saying, quote, everyone thinks differently, therefore everyone fights differently. Everyone moves differently, therefore everyone fights differently. Everyone is built differently, therefore everyone fights differently. But everyone must attest that all fighting comes from a common basis. So in the, the works that we study, you have the Italian works and the Spanish works, which differ slightly from the Germanic works, be, and so does their arms and armor, mm -hmm. and how the armor is designed. The Milanese armor is rounded, and the blows will slip off, and it's designed to stab up. The G German, Germanic armor, the Gothic armor, is designed to lift your weapon high over your head because you're a taller fighter. There are differences. Uh, a two-handed great sword with flanges and a ring hilt, I won't go near the thing. It's a monster. Mm -hmm. Give me that rapier, you give me that side sword, you give me that buckler and that dagger, and boom, I'm all over the place because yeah. there were differences. It's very uh, uh, um, uh, heterogeneous and how they approach their fighting arts, where the Japanese, it's pretty much one size fits all. Mm -hmm. Another thing, Western martial arts, the medieval renaissance, um, they are uniformly founded upon geometry. Geometry. Yep. They will quote Euclid. The master Lichtenauer in 1389 in his treaties, he quotes uh, uh, Aristotle in order to explain the principle of opposites. And he also, well, you have all these references to geometry and, and a foundation of geometry, and it would take an hour to explain how geometry is the basis, and how, like the Master Vadi says in 1482, fencing or fighting and geometry are one and the same. That they both are infinite in combination, and they both seek this resolution. Uh, it's all about spatial awareness. It's all yeah. about lines and curves and moving in a line or a curve it's all about contact uh, so this this is something you don't see in asian martial arts which are often founded upon metaphysical elements where our our masters talk to us about timing distance leverage physics attitude or kampfgeist martial spirit yeah well let, a, let, let me ask you just uh, because you've you've you're peeking all these questions, and and I want to sure. I want to get a couple in. I'm fascinated by what you're saying, but I I one of the things that uh, that I found in the studies that I did uh, in uh, martial arts through my life uh, was that the Japanese or the Oriental systems separated fighting. In other words, hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat was not uh, using uh, a nunchaku or or a com. A comma or a staff it was almost like you you compartmentalized uh weapons whether it would be the sword or any weapon from the hand-to-hand -hand combat and i don't think that was true in the western teaching was it really they, they do that i didn't know that <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, seriously, that's fast. I did. I did not. You, so you're saying that in Asian arts they come compartmentalize weapons well, and separate armed and unarmed? Well, it, in the exposure that I've had was, in other words, uh, in order to uh, progress to you know a sword or a weapon, you had to spend a year or two uh, training in the the the, the standard uh, you know karate or whatever it would be until you could graduate up to where you could start to use weapons and all that now that may have changed you know in the modern times because of course we're always after the quick uh okay that's been my experience and you have had more far more experience in asian styles but my experience whenever i have encountered it or or, or examined it or read about it that's that's true that they will they want you to study the unarmed and then the weapons are considered the advanced yes that's the high art Okay. Well, how it was explained to me by Professor Tom Green, Texas A&M, the, uh, the anthropologist uh, of martial arts, Professor Tom Green, who 
um, edited the uh, uh, ABC Clio uh, Encyclopedia of Martial Arts, the first one of its kind to include Western styles in it. You know, there's so many books that are called Encyclopedia of Martial Arts, and what they mean is just Asian styles. Yeah, you know, yeah. or Martial Arts of the World. I've and got a only, bunch of those. <laughs> and, and they don't even include India or Turkey or Central Asia, oh, yeah. which is a shame. Um, or, or Persia, you know, so, um, which has wonderful martial traditions. Anyway, uh, how he explained it to me was weapons are dangerous, and weapons are the great equalizer. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're built like Conan or you're built like, um, you know, you and I, the weapons, you know, that sword's still going to sever your hand or cut through your knee or puncture your face. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said that weapons are also the great exposer, meaning that you can be Mr. Badass, you know, a Taekwondo master. But as soon as we go at it staff to staff, this 15 year old kid with a couple weeks training can crack you upside the head or stab you in the face or yep. knock you in the, you know, crack the back of your hand. And so it takes longer to become more expert in weapons. So to avoid that embarrassment and to avoid that exposure and to avoid the danger of students in a small dojo, you know, McDojo somewhere swinging weapons around each other's faces, mm -hmm. uh, they just they put it off as something advanced. And I thought, wow, that 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 makes a lot of sense, because in our sources, it's all weapon based. And and you have like a uh, master Yoko Meyer, who I mentioned previously, he says, you know, the foundation of the art is the long sword. And now that you have learnt, studied the long sword, you have also studied the spear, the staff, the short sword and um, and the, the halberd because you have studied the long sword and Lichtenauer, the great master Johannes Lichtenauer, 1380. Oh, yeah. Who I mentioned, his teachings are the basis of the Germanic school for about 300 years. Lichtenauer says, quote, there is only one art of the sword and it is, and it is the foundation of all fighting. And and what is it? It's the two handed war, war sword. Yeah. Or, or the long sword, what you call in Italian a spada longa. So Did, did um, he also say that uh, all fighting is fighting? Kind of meaning you know, it doesn't matter what you have in your hand? Um rack in my brain and I, I can't recall something like that but he does say something of the that anyone who knows how to fight will read my teachings and understand that this is the real art yeah there's only one art of fighting in that regard um and what he's saying is basically, if you know how to fight, you read his work and go, oh, this makes sense. Yeah, this guy knows what he's talking about. You know, um, so uh, there is a, a gentleman named Professor Carl Friday, um, University of Athens here in Georgia. And he uh, wrote a book, I believe, called uh, Zen and the Art of the Sword or something like that. Oh, yeah. And he kind of um, blows the lid off the mythology of Bushido. And he says that what we consider to be Bushido, Bushido is, is largely a construct of the 19th century Meiji government, military government, who wanted to essentially – they were importing all these European systems, European train system, European telegraph system, European legal system, European school system, European hospital systems. They did this – Un, unparalleled, unmatched feat in human history. They went literally from the Middle Ages to the modern era mm -hmm. in, in two generations. You know, by 1902, they're defeating uh, the, the Russian Navy. It's an amazing yeah. feat. Amazing feat. But, of course, they did it by having essentially almost an anthill society. Uh, so he says that uh, they looked at the Prussian military system and said, hey, we really like how you're emphasizing this Teutonic heritage and we really like this, how you're emphasizing chivalry. We're going to take the idea of the samurai and their servitude and we're going to apply that to the entire population of Japan. So now everyone must have a samurai like attitude. Everyone must have loyalty and dedication and perseverance and strive for the good of the state and everyone must sacrifice and they they basically took these legends and folklore and they polished them up to use them to inspire the population towards their national socialism uh -uh, fascism you know mm -hmm. uh, and they were of course later inspired directly by the national socialist um oh yeah um of germany so and we know how that all ended yeah so that was their attitude and then 
we come along and we have to literally, you know, you know, bomb them into submission. And then you have um, or or Shiba who in, who invents Aikido. Yes, he invents Aikido, but only after his country is bombed into submission and only after he participates in the rape of Nanking. Now, more to him for being enlightened and coming, you know, finding Jesus. Great. But I have my doubts whether he really would have if they had not been bombed into submission. If they'd won, yeah. Because um, they repackaged Aki, uh, Aki Jiu-Jitsu into Aikido and said, yes, it's all based on love. Now can we keep teaching it? It's all about um, developing the inner person and perfecting your character. It's all about um, struggle of the individual. Oh, that sounds benign. Sure, you can teach it. And now the next thing you know, we have it being taught in America and you say the Pledge of Allegiance and you have the U.S. flag on the wall next to the Japanese flag and you have that little Shinto shrine. Ah, wait a minute. Guess what? You know where the Shinto shrine thing comes from? The meat government ordered all dojos in Japan to have a Shinto shrine by oh. or be closed. They either are closed down or they have to have a Shinto shrine. Prior to that, they didn't have it. They didn't have they they kept their martial arts within the families and within the villages. Mm -hmm. And it's only when Giordano Kano, the guy who invents judo, inspired by Western um, combat sports, says, "Hey, I'm going to do the same thing with judo," which was a brilliant move, of course. But um, they're not doing this indigenously on their own. They're doing it because they're repackaging it and represent, re presenting it differently. So in contrast to what I'm doing, I'm only looking at the historical sources of the actual Renaissance. And, um, and yes, it does bleed into the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. And yes, the knightly chivalric attitudes and values carry over into the, to the courtier and, and, and um, cavalier values of the Renaissance, absolutely. But these, we're reading the, the works of these actual masters of defense who are running their own schools for the public, mm -hmm. as well as private schools for the, the nobility. But they're telling us why you should study, how you should study, uh, what these, these skills are for, and every single one of them addresses an ethical and spiritual component as to when, where, and under what conditions it's appropriate to use violent force. They're never teaching these skills in a vacuum. Yeah. They're always saying these are skills that are, are, are to be used under these conditions to defend God, king, country, family, and self. And uh, so if someone says, oh, well, the, the Western martial arts, yeah, you had them, but they, they don't have a spiritual component. Bullshit. And then they'll say, oh, they don't have a meditation component. And I'll say, excuse me, what was that word? Meditation. And I go, I'm sorry, meditation. Oh, 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 you mean from the Latin meditatio for quiet, quiet contemplation and self introspection. Is that the word you're using? Stop using my word. You know. Or they'll use the word mindfulness. And I'm like, uh, that's my word. Or they'll use the word energy. You must punch with energy. I'm energy. Oh, you mean energia, energia? Stop using my word. You're taking my words out of the Renaissance and you're misappropriating them and you're using them in a modern context to replace some word of your own that doesn't quite mean the same thing. Wow. This is, this is fascinating, John. Let me, let me segue for just a minute. Sure, um, please. We, we talk, it's easy yeah. to get me to talk. It's difficult to get me to stop. No worries about that, man. <laughs> hey, um, the, uh, we mentioned the crusades, uh, briefly when the, um, the Europeans encountered the Saracens. Uh, they had a completely different type of sword weapon. Let's let's go with swords for a, you know since we're really talking about swords. Uh, do you know? I mean, we heard about the Damascus, but I I, I know Damas Damascene or Damascus blades had existed in Europe. Uh, all, all the way back, I think even uh, some Viking swords, and also I, I've heard that some uh, uh, gladius were actually uh, uh, had a Damascus type of folding and all that. But uh, we always hear about the scimitar, and was it just a completely different style of fighting that necessitated the use of that sword versus how we we presented ourselves in combat, or? 
yeah, don't know well, if that's a question, but go ahead. And... I think the, the reason that we're hearing about the scimitar is out of just ignorance because the Saracens weren't using scimitars for the most part. Um, they were using a slightly curved blade, which had been known since ancient times in the region. And it was sometimes called a shamshir. It sometimes was called a talwar. It sometimes was called, oh, two other names. And again, um, my memory today is a little off. I was just talking about this a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, there's a number of different blades, but these blades are for the most part curved blades and uh, sometimes they are wider at, towards the point to add that mass to a to a slash or slice. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're very pointy to give that under thrust. And they're designed pr primarily for horseback and camelback against light armor so that they can slash through cloth. They're not designed to encounter reinforced mail, although the Persians had some fantastic, gorgeous reinforced mail. And they're not designed to fight in a temperate zone. And they're not designed to go against plate armor. And they're not designed to go against hard reinforced leather. Um, they may be beautiful swords. And these type of swords, you find them all the way to Indonesia. Mm -hmm. But uh, they're, they're not very maneuverable. They're not very adroit in going from offense to defense and back again. What you sacrifice by getting that large slashing action uh, is you sacrifice the ability to ward and to cover and parry and to counter strike. And that's something that a, a straighter blade and a particularly straight blade does far better. So that's why you don't see these type of swords being adopted until the 19th century, 18th and 19th century, when we are no longer using armor, shields, uh, yeah, there's a couple of chest plates and helmets still around in the in the middle of the 19th century. But um, for the most part, nobody's going up against two-handed weapons and going up against long spears and shields and, and heavy lances. So that's when they start adopting that mameluke-hilted um, saber, which to yeah. this day, the Marine Corps has a mameluke-hilted saber that they don't even know the origin of. <laughs> But you have to keep in mind that the ancient Greeks had two types of curved swords. The Romans had a, a two types of cur curved swords. And even the, um, the, the Norse had a type of curved sword. So in the medieval era, in the Renaissance era, we had fauchions, baroulaires, bracumars, stortas, and malchuses, and messers. Six different types of curved swords that later become sabers and hangers. Well, you know, the you you touched on something here just briefly a, a couple seconds ago. Uh, the one of the things that uh, that I've seen in your videos, I'm going to take a left turn here uh, out of the Mid East. Uh, I've noticed that in watching some of the techniques that you uh, show in those videos and all that, is that you make use of the entire weapon. In other words, it could be. Uh, not so much uh, even the edge or the point at times, but the hilt and the guards and and also the the other uh, tools that you have at hand, including you know kicking and, and tripping and all of that good stuff. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of that. And again, I'm not an expert in uh, in the in the Far Eastern weapon systems, so to speak. But it seems like that's an important aspect of what you are involved in also. Uh, yes, definitely. Um, before I, I um, address that, let me back up to the previous question because you mentioned Damascus. Um, oh, yeah. I, don't, I don't know uh, enough about Damascus to comment on it one way or the other. I, metallurgy is not my thing. Uh, I only look at the functionality of the weapons, their form, their function, their, their, their utility mm -hmm. uh, as it relates to the source teachings and as it relates to the specimens that I've been able to handle and, and play with. So I, I really don't know whether um, a Damascus blade makes it stronger or sharper or harder mm -hmm. or more resilient or whether it's just a cosmetic thing. I, I couldn't say. I, I really can't say. You know, I think originally it was just a result of the folding process. And uh, in order to construct... Uh, the lengths of steel that they needed in the in their forging process that it was a kind of a byproduct and then it was one of those things where they they found that it gave it a springiness or maybe a uh, 
less uh, like a, uh, a homogenous, if you will, uh, hard, soft combination of steels throughout the. Because I think that uh, in the beginning they were they were having trouble getting carbon into the uh, into the iron, and so you ended up with pieces that were pure iron and then pieces that were now steel with the carbon in and the way they introduced it and all that. So anyway, uh, that's probably like so many things a uh, a mistake that turned into a, <laughs> a so-called advantage or, or whatever. Right. But well, uh, uh, I, I can say that. Um, uh, in Renaissance Europe, steel is not rare. You have whole towns that do nothing but mine ore, whole towns that process it, whole towns that make uh, blades, whole towns that make hilts and, and put them together. Mm -hmm. Whereas, to say, in Japan, by contrast, steel is uncommon. So they have to make the most of it and be ingenious about it. Whereas in Europe, even the most novice a student at a school of arms could walk in the door with a blunt steel training blade. The idea of a blunt steel training blade is uh, pretty much pretty much unheard of, I believe, in Japan or the rest of Asia. And yet it was a common tool. They used wooden swords in Europe as well, but um, mm -hmm. for practice, but it was better to use a blunt training sword. And uh, blunt training swords have only been around in my uh, craft for about 12 years now. And once they came on the scene, it transformed what we were doing because now we're using the actual training tools that these study guides and manuals are using themselves. Mm -hmm. And now we're able to practice things with something other than a replica that's unsharpened. And a lot of times the, the replicas are being made by people who know metallurgy, they know smithing, but they don't know dick about weapons. So they're making something that looks like a sword but when I pick it up, I'm like, oh, my God, did you not bother to check the dimensional geometry measurements of this to, and compare it to the original to see the center of gravity, the center of rotation, the center of percussion? Because what you made weighs three pounds more and handles like a brick. That would not be a good thing. No. And so by getting the accurate replicas and accurate training swords, it transformed what we're doing, which brings me to your question. Yes, there, uh, the master Dobringer said in 1389, no part of the sword is invented in vain, meaning we use everything. We hit with the pommel, which is where you get the phrase pummeling from. We, we stab with the cross, the guard. We use the point, the back edge, the front edge, with the flat. We even hit with the flat. We ward and cover with the flat. And um, in the Germanic school, there are five basic strikes that are called the Meisterhau, the master cuts. They offend and defend. The Japanese do something very similar. And these master cuts, three of the five of them are done with the back of the sword. You've never seen that in Highlander, Princess Bride, <laughs> Game of Thrones, Lord of the Rings. Uh, you don't see that in um, you know, Excalibur. You don't see that in Three Musketeers or Zorro. No. You know, well, you wouldn't anyway, but point is, you don't see it in video games. You don't see it in dinner theater shows. You don't see it in the fat guys dressing up in armor in the park and whacking each other with sticks, playing yeah. stick time. Yet that is the actual method. Hitting with the back of the sword, it's not only faster, it's more deceptive, and the geometry of it allows for a pop, 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 pop as you've seen in my videos, mm -hmm. a, a rapid fire striking. So we have 16 cuts we do with the long sword, as opposed to say in Kenjutsu where they have six because they have a single edge blade. Well, well, when we use a single edge blade, part of the back of the sword is usually sharpened to give it a false edge or a short edge so that we can still use the back of a curved blade. You know, th let me ask you, because one of the things that I've seen you do uh, a number of times is you grab the, you grab the blade with your other hand. Yeah, and, absolutely. you know, being, a, being someone who's not knowledgeable about this stuff, I always thought, yeah, but th you could never do that with a real sword in combat because they're so freaking sharp that you'd cut your own fingers off. And, you know... Being basically exposed to the katana and all that, it would be a bummer to, to grab a katana with your your ungloved hand on the other side and try and use that, yeah. you know. But when you mentioned it, it's something it's something I've never heard of. I, I've always wondered. You mentioned way earlier uh, when we were talking that the sharpening of 
the medieval combat or the Renaissance combat weapons or the the actual uh, combat swords, probably all the way back to the Romans and, and before, they weren't razor sharp. Is that what you're saying? That you could actually, there's a combat edge versus a show off edge and things like that? No, I think it's a more a matter of um, the term razor edge is simply misunderstood and, and misused. Um, if you think of a razor, razor blade, what do we do with razor blades today after we shave with them? We throw them away. Why? Because they go dull very quickly, don't they? Yes, they do. In the 19th century, um, one of the British uh, military swordsmen was writing about um, swords, and he says, you may take a straight razor, and you may tap it in your palm of your hand, and you will not be cut. But if you were to draw that razor across your palm, you would be sorely wounded. And this explains the nature of swords. Um, as far back as our earliest treaties that we study, they incorporate what they call in German Hobschwert or half sword techniques, sometimes called um, shortened sword. And in Italian, it's called mezza spada, um, middling the sword or middle sword or half sword again. And the part of the sword just above the cross is the least sharpened and so the easiest to grab. Mm -hmm. But later on, farther down the blade, you can still grab it. But there's a master in Master Filippo Vadi, 1482. He says, for fighting against armor, you will make your sword sharp one hand from the point. And this has been a matter of debate. Does he mean that it's only sharp one hand from the point, that, that, that region that you strike with, that center of percussion? Mm -hmm. Or does he mean that the sword's sharp, but that portion is really sharp? Or by sharp, did he mean a narrow point that is about as long as your hand, which is true. So he could mean one or the other or both. Nonetheless, I have put on uh, videos on YouTube in the past, and I'm going to be doing another one next month, where I demonstrate the facts of half sorting because it is one of the most um, difficult things to grasp, that you can grasp a sharp blade. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. when you study the sources and you look closely at how they're holding the weapon, you can see they're not squeezing the edges and they're not blocking with the edges. Their thumbs are placed on the flat or their thumbs are placed around it in a way that their fingers are gripping it so that the flat presses against the palm. And when you do these deflecting techniques and these binding techniques, you are not hitting your hand up against that edge and you're certainly not pulling. Um, I've actually done it with blunt swords on a wooden post a, called a pell, a training pell. Mm -hmm blunt swords and i've hurt my hand using blunt swords going oh, okay so you def definitely don't use these techniques but these other ones you definitely do and i have videos of me deflecting uh uh full force blows with blunt swords um show how the techniques work mm -hmm. in videos though what i've done is i will cut a pool noodle with a sharp sword then i will cut uh at a two by four and, and cut two inches into the two by four using the same spot then I'll grab that same spot and do a bunch of moves. Then I'll hand the sword to somebody and I will grip that same spot and have them using two hands try to pull the sword out of my hand and they cannot. Mm -hmm. And I show, hold my hand up to the camera and go, look. And sometimes you'll see a little crease on my hand. Then I'll take the sword and again I'll cut a pool noodle again. And the reason it's difficult to understand is because people today do not – use swords on a daily basis mm -hmm. they do not use swords to defend their lives they do not use swords and big blades to uh commit violence and when they do it's a knife and a knife can always have an incredibly sharp edge but a knife does not have to ward off parry and counter strike against big blades a knife doesn't have to hit slam against uh, armor and metal rimmed shields. It doesn't happen. So a knife has a different bevel and a different angle and a different oh, yeah. than a, a sword. A sword's not a big knife. Mm -hmm. So um, a, a lot of times you'll get adolescents on the internet who go, you can't grab a sword because they saw a katana once. And it's like, well, okay. These sources are filled with anecdotes of people half-sorting, and they were even doing it into the, the 18th and 19th centuries with sabers by putting their hands on the back of sabers, and in some cases on the dull sabers, they would grip them a little farther down. Mm -hmm. So we know we're still doing it.
and, and it is real, and it makes up probably 25% of all the techniques with the swords in our sources, whether it's a two-handed sword, a long sword, a great sword, a war sword, a side sword, an arming sword, a single hand blade, a falchion, even a rapier. They're doing it with all of those swords. It's a fact. They really did it. It really works. Okay. Now, I have one question, too, because uh, you in your book that uh, I read several years ago, the one of the I, I don't know which one came first, if it was medieval swordsmanship or whatever, but uh, you are also involved in some of the forensic uh, uh, study of, of the battle wounds and things like that that people suffered in order to understand how combat was actually engaged in. And you had, uh, there was a section in there about a battle uh, where it was in Visby, I believe, uh, off uh, Sweden, an island, where they, it, they were in a rush. They just threw everybody in a, in a hole after the battle. And uh, it preserved these skeletons with all these actual battle wounds. They weren't burned or cremated or anything like that. And I think that was the Scand- – of course, it was Scandinavian. But could you just brief on that for a moment, the, 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 the bullet points about what you found from the study of those skeletal remains? Um, well, I, I didn't study it. I just reported on uh, the study. Okay. But I made some observations uh, about it going, well, duh, yeah, those type of wounds would occur – doing the techniques that are in our sources. And those type of wounds are the type of things that we, the, those are the blows we land when we're, we're doing our free play or sparring. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it makes perfect sense. And the, the Bisbee find is just, was a gold mine for uh, arms and armor, mostly armor. And um, it, um, it, it matches up exactly with all the things we're doing, particularly the, the, the blows and the wounds to the lower legs. Yeah, and that's the, what I'm going at. And the blows to the backs of the head, because the assumption was, and they made the same, same assumption with the, fi- the the Richard III skeletal finds recently, too. Mm-hmm. Um, I addressed this at a uh, conference in uh, Scotland about three years ago. They, uh, Richard III also has wounds to the back of his head. And I was able to demonstrate that you can put wounds on the back of someone's head even as you're facing the front of them using the proper historical techniques. And I can do it like pop, 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 pop. And there it is, four Mm -hmm. wounds. And it's hitting the back of the skull, back of the neck, back of the collar. And it's like, wow, they they didn't know this. Because, again, the archaeologists, the anthropologists, the ARBS curators, they're not martial artists. Yeah. So there's that issue. Um, Yeah, I did. I wrote some books in the um, late 90s that were still in print as of December of last year. And then the company finally folded. So they were in print for um, 19 years. I'm going to put them back up on Amazon just for posterity. Uh, They were the first books of their kind addressing some of the authentic methods and and, uh, facts. But um, they were written at a time when I I knew very little and was having to hypothesize and did not have the translations available. But I said in the books – I said, hey, someday we will have translations of all these sources and then some, and it will change everything. So I was right. And it did change by about 2001. And mm-hmm. then I changed my curriculum in 2004. Then I changed it in 2008. And fortunately, I've had the same curriculum now for 10 years. You know, Sometimes you just got to throw out everything you think you know and reinterpret it and reformulate it. But uh, you, know, you don't want to systematize it. That's the danger. Yeah. Re-systematizing it. Then it becomes it, dogma sport and that's what we're seeing today there's a big sport movement to doing tournaments and they're having to they're making it very artificial and regulated and they're limiting and they're basically turning it into sport fencing with two weapons or sport fencing with double hand weapons and i think that's a shame and i don't support that movement uh back back to that the visby thing what i took from what you wrote uh in there was that when you looked at the wounds you would see killing blows to the head but you would see deep and sometimes severing wounds to the legs. And kind of sifting through that, you would say, well, the the way that things are, are seen on TV and in the movies is it's the head strike and then the guy's down or you stab him and through the chest or whatever. And uh, really never addresses those legs. And you looked at it and said, hey, if I hit the guy in the head first, why would I hit him in the leg? Because if I cleaved his skull, there's no reason for me to cut his thigh in half. So what I took from that was that 
these guys were actually going for those lower extremities as a as a first strike uh, uh, target. Um, I'm not sure I would concur with it being a first strike. Okay. Because we have to consider um, how many people are fighting him. You know, if I'm fighting somebody, and I kill my opponent, and I look over, and there's my uh, comrade fighting somebody else. I'll just go whoop and take that leg out. That's the easiest thing to hit. And with the long swords, you can do a particular one-handed move that will hit the lower legs. Mm-hmm. Also, um, the upper body tends to be um, uh, well armored. Yeah. Uh, Whereas, you know, and if somebody goes to the ground, his legs and knees are closest to you now. So just kind of get hit a little bit. The master Lichtenauer says that um, cut high cuts or over cuts above the waist are always superior to lower cuts because the low cuts leave you vulnerable. But they do show lots of legs being hit in the sources that we study. They definitely are hitting to the shin, the ankle. Master Meyer even refers to a blow he calls der Fusshau, the foot cut. Ooh. You take the foot off, he ain't going to be fighting That's anymore. nasty. Yeah. Well, I know one of the Vikings, because uh, I read a lot of stuff on the Vikings and a lot. One, one of the guys, I can't remember who it was, but he had a sword he called leg biter. <laughs> so, what does that say? But uh, it's interesting too because I don't think a lot of people understand. They they see things in terms of y- you and me standing with a lot of space around us. But when when guys were fighting in actual battle, where it was just a crush of people, y- right. you you might not your feet might not even be touching the ground because you're held up by the shoulders and that of the of the guys that are pressed in so close to you. So. Yes. Uh, the, the One of the first things I do to any student who visits me, I don't care what their background or training or athleticism is, uh, whether they're a complete uh, uh, teenage novice or, or what, as I completely remove their conceptualization of swordsmanship uh, that they have gotten from pop culture. And the conceptualization is parry repost. And parry repost is a Baroque concept. I strike, you block it, then you hit me. The medieval and Renaissance sources do not include that double-time parry repost action as doctrine. They actually warn against it. They do everything uh, stesso tempo, single time. You cut at me, I cut at you at the same time. You stab at me, I stab at you at the same time. You don't cut at me, I cut at you. You don't stab at me, I stab at you. You try to counter my cut or thrust, I counter your attempt to counter mine. That's the art. And this art requires you continually closing in and binding up against the other guy's weapon. You don't stay away. You don't dodge it. You don't avoid it. You don't parry it. You deliberately seek out the contact with his weapon. Lichtenauer says it best when he says, a man attempting to to defend his adversary's blows, it is useless and he is already beaten. No one defends himself except out of fear. If you understand this, he can't hit you. Translation, if he's too busy guarding and defending and blocking, then he's not striking at you, is he? Yep, and he can never react as fast as you can act. So the idea is, um, in Italian, they say it perfectly as, offesa e una defesa. Offense is defense. (laughs) I I actually used that, and I didn't even know it was from from Italian. (laughs) It's, it was first found in Capo Ferro's um, uh, Opera Nova from 1610, and he's teaching Ray Peer, and I was the one who found it in that phrase, that actual phrase. But the sentiment is expressed in earlier Italian works by phrases such as, there is no defense excepting that we offend or uh, similar things. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. I, will off- I will offend you with my defense. Yeah. Ooh, I love that one. So I like to say that in martial arts, everything is about defense. Except defense. Defense is about offense. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is uh, if you're defending, you're not attacking, and the attacker wins. I mean, it's almost it, it's. I, I look at it, boxing, and you can be a great counter puncher, but they're very, very, very few and far between. You have to have the the timing and the ability to read that opponent that most boxers, as good as they are, do not have. Some guys have it. And it doesn't give you a long career because you are going to trade blows if you are a if you approach boxing as a counter puncher. The best boxers are the guys that they they start and they don't stop until you're knocked on your ass. And, and when it comes to weapons, um, you can't trade blows no, because God. blows are lethal. 
And so the whole point of the art is to be able to defend yourself and overcome a, an opponent who is stronger than you, as Master Licknauer teaches. And this comes about through this um, use of uh, the, the counterfighting. So they're all counterfighting, but they're counterfighting by provoking you. I provoke you, then I take away what I provoked, and then I hit the opening I've created by taking away what I provoked. Wow. So they take the whole chaos of fighting and reduce it down to provoking, taking, and hitting. Now, having said that, when it comes to knives, we should have a separate talk sometime just about daggers. I, I want to. I, we haven't even touched on it. And I'm, I'm, I make no claims to be a dagger or knife expert. I'm a swordsman. <clears throat> Oh, the other weapons, absolutely. But the dagger always is always a question mark for me. But what's fascinating is that the Master Fiore di Liberi in 1410, he starts out saying, okay, you're going to learn the unarmed techniques, and then from there we're going to progress to dagger. And he says, may the Lord have mercy on us. <laughs> wow. Because of all the weapons, the dagger is the one that – you got to get in close and you can't parry it. You can't ward it. Yeah. You can't counter thrust it. You can't counter slash it. You got to get personal. And the, um, then he goes from the dagger to the sword, or single hand sword, double hand sword, the spear, the, the uh, pole axe, etc., all the mm -hmm. way up to combat in armor. And Talhofer, Hans Talhofer, and one of the works attributed to him also says, now we come to the dagger. May God have mercy on our soul. <laughs> Very similar. And the English master, George Silver, writing in 1599, one of the few English works we have, he says, with the dagger, the dagger is not to be warded and you cannot win the place of it. Cannot win the place of it. By that, he means you can't bind up against it, yep. trap it, you know, get it in that position where you can do something around it or off yep, of it. Yep. Yeah, very, very We're gonna different. We're going to do that because I, I, you're going down my direction and the things that you're talking about, I, I have found uh, out just by personal experience a lot of that. The, the disarms and the traps and a lot of those things, come on. I always, I always tell people, look, it's like trying to hit a mosquito with a dart. Yeah. It, it's, yeah. You're that close. You can't see it. You can definitely feel it, but uh, you know, think about how fast someone can move their their hands and all that. When you've got a long weapon, it's a little easier to track. Uh, but John, let's do this. Let's do this because uh, you're you're winding up. I can see you've got a bunch of thoughts you're going to pour out on the page. We got to quit. We've gone on for almost yeah, two hours. I, I mentioned my show. I, I want you to tell me uh, a bunch of things. I want me. I want you to uh, give the the website. Let us know where people can. Uh, find some of the stuff that you've talked about today, some of those documents and things. Also, any books you've got coming out, because I'm fascinated by, by your research. And then you've mentioned a show. Coming out, but I have a book uh, that is coming out called By Point and Edge. And as you mentioned earlier, its main focus is wounds. Uh, my philosophy has always been you can't really talk about what, how these weapons are used and how they uh, were made unless you understand what they do. And it's all about the wounds. When you understand the wounds that these – the injuries that these weapons occur and how the human body responds physiologically, psychologically, now you understand why they're doing these techniques. Now you understand why they're designing weapons to optimize to those wounds and why they're optimizing their style to do these techniques which optimize those weapons to do those wounds. Whew. Ooh. So, what was the name of that book again? I forgot. <laughs> it's, uh, publishers tentatively calling it by Edge and Point, and when, uh, it's when, a history of sword combat. When do you believe that'll be available? Twenty nineteen. Yeah. Okay. Uh, excellent. Um, also, um, uh, my website is uh, www.thearma.org, and my personal website for my Iron Door School of Arms here outside of Atlanta is uh, historicalfencing.com. And I, I give uh, group lessons, private lessons. I also do um, lectures and presentations around the world. And um, I will be this fall co-hosting a new combat sport program on the History Channel. And uh, although I myself, my organization doesn't participate in a sportified version of Renaissance martial arts, what this program is doing is absolutely spectacular. It, nothing like this has ever been on, done on television before. It will blow you away. 
Uh, this is the largest program the History Channel has ever done outside of their dramatic series like Vikings. Mm-hmm. This is it is a contest show. I cannot say anything about it except that it involves weapons, weapons, and weapons, and <laughs> it, it's serious. It is. I mean, we're talking. Imagine the Hunger Games meets U- UFC with weapons. Outstanding. And it is. It is serious. I was freaked out by it when I saw it. it when the way they're doing it. The way it's being presented, um, it it is um, is quite fantastic, and uh, I have no doubt. And I am not one for embellishing or exaggeration, but I have no doubt that it's going to be a national and international phenomenon. Excellent. It, and when is that coming out? I'm told late November is the tentative premiere this year. Uh, this year, yeah, eight episodes. Um, and uh, it will the finale will be in I think January or February, mm-hmm. um, and there are already um, you know rumors about a second season because the network oh, is so yeah. impressed with it. Um, oh, congratulations! That's outstanding. Your uh, exposure in that regard can do nothing but uh, help propagate the interest in uh, the things that you teach. I, I want to well, ask you one more time to help educate youth. Outstanding. Hey, listen, you mentioned your website, D-Arma. Could you spell D-Arma? Because I don't know if people understand. The, the, as in the. Uh, the, A-R-M-A, the Arma. Oh, the Arma, the Arma. Got it. I just want to make sure people aren't searching for something that uh, The Association for Martial Arts. Excellent. Yeah. Well, John, this has been an outstanding. Uh, I, f- I feel like I just uh, signed up for a college course, and and we've already gone through half a semester <laughs> worth of material. <laughs> you know, the thing is, you can't just study the fighting. You got to study the martial culture, which means you got to study the history, which means you end up having to study the Dark Ages and the and the Greeks and Romans, and, and then you got to study the Baroque era and then the nineteenth century. It's Oh, it's it's I, I'm a martial arts instructor and I spend six hours a day on my butt typing. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. I, I spend six hours on, on my butt uh, reading uh, because I read a, as much as I can uh, on all of those things. And you're absolutely right. Once you start down that path and, and it's interesting, too, uh, you know, I can tell because I know where I'm at. Uh, I can see it in you. You never did any of this as a hobby it's a way of life and when it becomes a way of life you can't get enough of it you can't study it enough you can't train in it enough you can't know enough about it you will be an eternal eternal student and i'm i'm fascinated by the fact and deeply impressed that you say things like i had to change my curriculum or i was i was right about this until i was proven wrong by by new evidence that is the true pathway to enlightenment and i think you're on it and i'm deeply deeply impressed and we get new translations or we have a new insight or an epiphany or we say look we we thought it was this posture or this technique and then we found out it's it's this or i am in it and i have an enviable position because i have handled hundreds and hundreds of actual specimen swords and i've had uh, the opportunity for decades to cut with sharp weapons and i've i've cross trained and i've been doing this professionally for a long time and so it gives me certain insights that a lot of other people don't have but there's some fantastic work being done around the world in this field and uh every year there's another book being published and there's another event being held and there's some some other organization coming on the scene and we have a whole generation of young practitioners enthusiasts who who came into martial arts by coming into the european styles that have been yep. recovered reclaimed re uh, reconstituted revived Mm-hmm. But it's an ongoing process. It's not finished. The Asian martial arts, they're done. They're finished. Here they are. They spoon feed them to you. We we dump a stack of books on you and say, get to work. You're on <laughs> your own. <laughs> That's I, I got it. And, yeah. and again, uh, you know, no one would know about I, I would not have known about any of those uh, documents, those books, those translations, unless I had picked up that that original book that you wrote back there, it was I think it was Paladin Press, wasn't it? When yeah, they were, Paladin. Yeah. And, of course, I went on to uh, uh, get a lot of those uh, things that you had mentioned in there. And uh, just so people know, the, these books are available. You kind of, I guess you just have to Google search them and all that. And, yeah. Uh, uh, Amazon. 
my name. I did another one called Masters of Medieval and Renaissance Martial Arts. It's an anthology with other authors. And I've also written for uh, uh, a bunch of other um, anthologies, and, and I've written introductions and to about seven other books. I've had, I think, seven of my students have gone on to write books. So, Well, that's but outstanding. This entire genre of books has just exploded, and um, it's only going to improve more and more. But uh, it's a fascinating subject. It's an amazing subject. And, you know, I have students in South Korea. I have students in Mexico. And they're just as fascinated with uh, medieval and Renaissance uh, martial heritage as, as we are, in the same way that we in the West are fascinated with Asian martial arts. Mm -hmm. Well, I know I am. And uh, I, I just can't wait. Let's do this again, John. I, I want to talk about two things next time. And I don't want you to start now. I want to talk about the, the, the movies. I want to talk about the reproduct reproduction uh, swords and your critique of them or or whatever, and then the daggers and and stuff like that. So let's save that. If you're up for it, man, I'd love to talk to you again. Uh, let's do it in, in after the show premieres, and that way we can talk about um, sure. that. Outstanding. I really appreciate it. So, John, I, I thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, I mean, honest, I'm... I, I'm back at school, and I'm looking at. Uh, I can't wait to do this again. I mean, it's fascinating. I love this. I love the history. I love the stories. I love the the anecdotes. Uh, you, you've got a hell of a hard drive going on there, buddy. I got to tell you that. <laughs> it was it was a privilege and a pleasure, Ernest, and uh, we talk more often. Outstanding. Well, John, thank you. And at this point, uh, I'm going to say goodbye, Danny. I'll see you, John. Yep. Thank Thanks. you, John. Appreciate it. And, uh, John, we will uh, be in touch. Uh, I'll let you know when this is going to come up. And uh, oh. you can push it out to all your people, too. So Sounds more, good. more the merrier. Thank you, John. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, man. Bye. Well, Danny, there you have it. I, I told you this guy is fascinating. Uh, yeah. And, and he's controversial. Uh, there's people that, that you know, are willing to sit and listen to what he has to say, and then there's the the critics. And I think that, you know, anytime you have somebody who uh, uh, shakes the foundations of things that are kind of have been in place for a while, mm -hmm. uh, people are resistant uh, to change. They're they're, you know, my teachers taught me this because his teacher taught him that because his teacher taught him that you know that kind of thing starts taking place and john has come in and uh really really shaken the rafters of the of the uh the way that the medieval and renaissance martial arts and and things are are viewed by most people and uh i'm telling you i i've I've sat in on a couple of his lectures. I've known him for a number of years. I've I've seen a lot of his stuff on on YouTube and all that. And and honest, I'll you know I'm not a guy who knows a lot about uh, medieval combat or fighting in armor and all that good stuff. But I do know about hand to hand combat and I know about edge weapons and I know what you can do against an opponent uh, just from my lifetime basically of training in stand-up fighting and uh, and ground fighting and the things that John is proposing with the weapons it dovetails with that a hundred percent he's one of those guys that I've, I've I know that when he when he I guess uh, goes on this journey to find these these techniques or see something or hear something or, or comes across something that he puts it to the test and, and it's not a theory uh, if if it can't work then it doesn't work in other words he takes it out of the next uh, revision yeah and you know you can you can show me how to do a bunch of crazy stuff but can I do it against an opponent who's trying to kill me can I do it against an opponent who outweighs me by 50 or 60 let's pounds? find out yeah so <laughs> and that's what it comes down to let's find out and I think that what uh, at times has ruffled a lot of feathers is he said let's find out and he finds out and some people that have been teaching stuff for a long time don't want to find out because then it invalidates their 
their yeah. their uh, methodology or their teaching, and it's fascinating. John's he, he's a high energy guy. <laughs> we we really could have talked for another couple hours and easily. And uh, and I mean, just let John go, you know. And uh, it was a fascinating thing. I, I his his knowledge of history and all that I too is. Where was he pulling those dates from? <laughs> <laughs> He, I don't think he's drunk as much uh, whiskey as I have over the years. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that was fun, Danny. I really appreciate it uh, having him on, and I thank you, Danny, for being with me today and uh, making this happen. So, folks, uh, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Uh, we'll have John on again. And uh, check him out. You know, Check out his YouTubes. Check out his website. Uh, check out his books. Uh, he says they're invalidated because of new knowledge. You know what? They're great books. They're still valid. Uh, I, I gained a lot of insight into a lot of things uh, reading those original books that he wrote. So I can't wait for the next ones. And uh, on that, thank you all, and I hope you enjoyed it. I wanted to thank our sponsors today, uh, Hoist Gracie uh, Jiu-Jitsu South Bay. Uh, and uh, they're formed at uh, Hoist Gracie South Bay uh, so Gracie's jiu-jitsu south bay.com yeah and uh also uh, uh the order of the black shamrock found at uh order of the black shamrock.com and uh you can uh, subscribe to the podcast uh you can uh, find us on all the podcast apps twitters and instagrams and stitchers and all that good stuff so we're we're out there and uh you know i just wanted to uh be sure that uh we all take time to to thank all the people that make our wonderful lives possible. And uh, so I want to just say, hey, you know what? It's time to uh, think every once in a while uh, in your busy day. Uh, take the time to, uh, to think about. And, and, and if you meet any of these people in person, to, to put your hand out and, and thank them and tell them how much you appreciate uh, what they're doing. And those people are the... Uh, the soldiers, uh, the sailors, the airmen, the Marines, the Coasties, uh, all of the people that uh, wear the uniform or the badge, uh, including all of our first responders. Uh, you know, those people are out there every day doing uh, the, the dirty work that uh, keep us safe and putting their lives and, and their futures on the line. And uh, we owe them everything. Uh, you know, our ability to have uh, uh, the greatest nation that uh, has ever existed on this planet is a result of the efforts of those people, the, the sacrifices that they've made and are, and are still going to be making for us. And it's because of their efforts that uh, all of us can uh, sleep soundly uh, in our beds at night. And uh, we thank all of you and are eternally grateful for your service and uh, all the things that you do for us. And uh, on that note, Danny... I think it's time to say goodbye. Very good. Signing out. <laughs>